Okay, welcome back. Um, we're only on chapter three. Uh, I thought I would fit it in the last one, but I'm just, it's too much. So, um, going back to that first initial question of a Q3 question, uh, where it was talking about um, the, the protagonist, in this case, Nick Carraway, we would use Nick Carraway for this, and uh, he is inwardly questioning, even though outwardly we start to see him conform. And last time I talked about the lost generation, and I just, I know that, that these videos may be a little bit um, tedious, but um, if you want to get a four or five on the AP test, then you will read and you will go th through all of it and um, soak it in because that's what it takes. And I'm gonna show you the difference and why it's so important to contextualize. Uh, let's just look at two possible uh, thematic sentences or uh, thesis or whatever it is that you use. I like to use claim because I feel like you're actually going to claim something opposed to stating something. So I wanna show you an example of two different sentences I wrote. And one of them, um, I'm just gonna say it's whether it's good or bad, it's limited. And this is typically what I would see from students when they first start writing their essays for either the Q2 or Q3. Nick Carraway's narration of The Great Gatsby shows how he is within and without. Okay, not bad. But think about the rest of the essay. What are you going to do to prove that Nick Carraway is within and without. Basically, you're gonna go back through the plot and give examples of the plot of showing when he felt like the third wheel. And that's all you can do. But the last part of that question says, how does this demonstrate your knowledge of the novel as a whole? And you won't be able to do that with a limited claim because that's, that's as far as you're gonna go. And that at best will be a six. Most likely it's gonna be a five. And as a teacher, I, I could read these um, thesis statements and claims and, and know right away whether it was going to be in the five, six range or whether it was gonna be seven, eight, maybe nine range, just depending on what all is said in the claim. So even though we don't know like the whole piece yet, um, even, even now with just contextualizing and having more to offer about the text than just the book itself, I can switch that to the new claim. Nick Carraway, who feels within and without, is a voice for the lost generation, a generation of post-World War I survivors trying to fit in with the new American narrative while inwardly questioning. I could even go further with that. And in fact, I probably would. I'm going to show you the best trick you could possibly ever learn. It's right where I have a generation. You see how I, you, if you're having trouble writing a thesis, just write a simple sentence like this. Nick Carraway feels within and without uh, is a voice for the lost generation. Now, if you modify that lost generation and explain it. It's called a repeat modifier. And all you have to do is just put a comma and repeat a generation of post-World uh, World War I survivors or, or whatever, a lost generation and then a further description. The reason why this is gonna be the best pattern for you is because you constantly need to a analyze and analyze. So you're, you're constantly pushing m deeper and deeper into a text. And this structure allows you to do that. Okay, so if you don't learn anything else from me, just learn this and you'll, you'll do better. <laughs> okay, so I wanna show you that, but also looking at chapter three as now a context of seeking out evidence for this lost generation. It's going to make you read the passages differently and with uh, just more 
um, analysis because now you have something to shoot for. Now you know where you're headed. And when you know, and that's why I would sometimes um, recommend that you read or you watch these videos or you look up whatever it is that you're going to do um, ahead of time. Don't worry about schooling the plot. It's no longer about plot anymore. It, those days are over anyways. It's all about the analysis of the story. So it doesn't matter if you skip ahead and you know what's going to happen. Big deal. What's important is that you fix your lens and that you are able to see things that other people are not able to see because that's what's going to distinguish you in the end when you write your essays. And imagine if you do this with enough text with different um, varieties of, of types of writing, like we're kind of looking at stream of consciousness and modern pieces, but um, we could also look at um, the text through um, a Victorian age or um, feminism or realism. And when you start to see that enough, it's kind of like what I pointed out with the Industrial Revolution. Once you see that kind of dystopia, you'll see it everywhere. And you'll be able to recognize it and you'll be able to call it what it is. And you're going to get so much better. Now, it actually gets exciting to do this because it's like you really start to feel like you know what you're doing. You could just give me any text you want and I'll give you an analysis. And that's, that's where we want you to be. That's what the class is about. So I hope you're doing this in class. So anyways, um, keeping in mind the lost generation, let's look at a party scene from chapter three. Okay, so this is his, the party is coming, he's describing it in the very beginning. He just, um, you know, just talks about the, the mass number of um, volume of, of oranges and limes that have to go through for the cocktail. This is important, you know, and it's like a machine. He's ready for the next party. There's a cleanup crew and it all goes back like a machine, you know, like a factory. Okay, the bar is in full swing and floating rounds of cocktails permeate the garden outside until the air is alive with chatter and laughter and casual innuendo and the introductions forgotten on the spot and enthusiastic meetings between women who never knew each other's names. The lights grow brighter as the earth lurches away from the sun and now the orchestra is playing yellow cocktail music and the opera of voices pitches a key higher. Laughter is easier, minute by minute, spilled with the prod prodigality, tipped out at a careful, I'm sorry, cheerful word. The groups change more swiftly, swell into new, with new arrivals, dissolve and form in the same breath. Already there are wanderers, confident girls who weave here and there among the stouter and more stable, become for a sharp, joyous moment the center of the group and then excited with triumph glide on through the sea change of faces and voices and color under the constantly changing light. I think what's interesting about this passage is the movement. It's, um, you could even describe the musicality of a piece. He wants to show uh, a party scene that's that's in and out and kind of like even the other scene though because there's liquor involved there's a little bit of a uh, confusion and people reappearing and disappearing and you see how many words he actually uses that um, show what he says at the end this constant um, constantly changing light the, he describes them like as a swell with arrivals, dissolve, form with the same breath. It also has, which a lot of times, one way to tell kind of a stream of consciousness is it almost feels like you're moving underwater. It's like the scene where Atticus, um, he comes out and he, he's like a, she says it's, it's almost like an underwater swimmer. It's a memory of 
of, of him walking out in the street and it, it's sort of at the end maybe not the the actual description of when it's happening but when she thinks back on it that's what it, it reminds me of and so there's this constant moving motion it's always in movement it's never staying in one place for very long and if you had already thought of making a claim about the lost generation and you were doing a prose like this, it would make it so much easier to go through the text and pick out the individual words that connote being a wanderer or lost. Even Nick Carraway, as he's trying to uh, find somebody, fortunately, Jordan happens to be there. And when he sees her, uh, well, before that, he says he was on his way to get roaring drunk with on sheer embarrassment when Jordan Baker came in. And then he says, hello, and he says it's much louder than he needed to be. But just a, a little detail like that really shows the scene of, of a party and feeling out of place and just wanting to belong. And going back to uh, the generation, the lost generation, you have to appreciate the fact that, you know, these people that came back uh, from war, think about it this way, they go back to their hometowns, they try to go back and hang out with the people they knew and the places that they remember, and they try to be the same person and get the same enjoyment out of it, and they just can't do it. And so here's this wonderful happening place like Paris, and I actually was fortunate enough to go on a, like a European, it reminds me of the European vacation with my family, but um, we were in Paris and there is a lot of, I mean, what, what you do in Paris is basically go find a cafe and sit around and pretty much um, drink and eat all day. And sometimes there's music, sometimes there's not, sometimes it's entertaining, sometimes it's not, but these people during this time were always escaping um, out in the open where there were people because the apartments, and I can certainly testify to this, but the apartment that we rented, that we stayed in, it was like a dungeon. It, it had no windows. And in a lot of places in, um, uh, in France don't have um, a air condition, which you know, was important to us because we were there in the summer, but also probably at, at this time a heater. So you could go to a cafe and you could buy, you know, a drink and pretty much just sit there all day. And they got used to the, just the, the social aspect of it and, and always having people around. They, they were, it's almost like they were afraid to be alone. And you see that also at the end of the chapter when Nick says that the worst part and he actually does say that he was I forgot about this part but he actually does very clearly say that he's now that he's written all this down and he's rereading it what it must sound like but um, I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit because he's Okay, so he said, I took dinner usually at the Yale Club. For some reason, it was the gloomiest event of my day. And I could see Fitzgerald saying something like that. Um, he and um, Zelda were the life of the party, and apparently they hated it when people wanted to go home because they could drink forever and other people couldn't. And so um, there's one story that where Zelda allegedly boils the guest shoes so that it would they wouldn't leave they would have to wait for their shoes to dry they just didn't want it to end and when you're restless like that and Nick says he's restless in the beginning he was restless from the war he came back from the war restless as everybody else did uh, there's a, like I said before a fear of being present in the moment it's like you're always trying to escape it so um, of course he's talking about how he, you know, would, would try to socialize with people. And, and then this is a very telling paragraph. He said, I began to like New York, the racy, adventurous feel it at night and the satisfaction that the constant flicker 
of men and women and machines gives to this restless eye. I like to walk up Fifth Avenue and pick out romantic women from the crowd and imagine that in a few minutes I was going to enter into their lives and no one would ever know or disapprove. Sometimes in my mind I followed them to their apartments on the corners of hidden streets and they turned and smiled back at me before they faded through the door into warm darkness. At the enchanted metropolitan twilight, I felt a haunting loneliness sometimes and felt it in others. Poor young clerks who loitered in front of windows, waiting until it was time for a solitary restaurant dinner. Young clerks in at dusk, wasting the most poignant moments of night and of life. So I think that uh, that also really demonstrates the restless wanderer, um, the, you know, just the fact that he's watching women and imagining them being in, in his life, yet he doesn't really make any real commitment or moves to be with women, but there's this little subtle thing that's very telling about him, I think, and that is that he could do this without anybody's disapproval. So, and, and just like whatever he's not talking about what happened in the Midwest with some girl, uh, and, and that it's, it shouldn't be scandalous, but I guess when you have your relatives controlling your money and your livelihood, then, yeah, it's, it's like you're, you're basically a puppet on a string, and you can't do much about it. So I want to mention him in, um, at the end, but... You notice that the party winds down kind of the same way that it winds down in the other, where it's, it's a little bit confused and um, people are now fighting instead of having a good time. Wives are now mad at their husbands. This is so typical. And it, it doesn't matter what time period you're in, you could see something like this and it happens. Um, happening anywhere and everywhere, especially with married spouses, because there's a lot more going on than what is said. And that's what's so wonderful about Fitzgerald's prose, is that he doesn't have to say or describe an entire scene in detail for you to feel like you were right there in the room. And you understand the impression of what he's trying to say, uh, whether or not they're real characters to you, it doesn't matter. It's a typical person. It's a typical scene. And so all he does, all he has to say, like in that one scene at the very end of chapter two, he's got the drunk guy in the elevator. He doesn't say this guy was so drunk, you know, he could barely stand up and he was playing with the dials. All he does is through like two lines of dialogue, the guy says, take your hand off the, the ledger or whatever, and he says, well, I didn't know I was touching it. And you know, you could just imagine that this guy is it's just, he doesn't even know what he's doing. That's all he's got to say and do, and it's a movement of the text. It kind of gives off this surreal, dreamlike feeling of excitement, and yet also, like Nick says later, this haunting loneliness that's constantly following these people. Um, when the party begins, I want to look at one. Suddenly one of these gypsies in trembling opals seizes a cocktail out of the air, dumps it down for courage, and moving her hands like Frisco dances out alone on the canvas platform. A momentary hush and there is a burst of chatter as the erroneous news goes around that she's Gilded Gray's understudy from the Follies. The party has begun. So what we have in that description is a single moment again where a woman, uh, she's finally had a little bit too much to drink. She's the one that gets out there before anybody's like, woohoo! And that lightens up everything. The chatter starts. The gossip starts. 
and then he has that simple sentence, the party um, has begun. If you were writing about this, then uh, you would definitely say something about that one simple sentence. And when it's modern, when it's a modern text, what you're trying to do is, is show that it's happening in the right now, in the moment. Even though he's looking back and telling you this, there's a way of bringing it with that changing movement and, um, you know, as the orchestra is obliging, they're watching, they're waiting, here it is, there she goes out there to dance, and then they start. Um, but the same way things kind of wound up, they also wound, uh, wind down. I looked around. Most of the remaining women were now having fights with men, said to be their husbands. Even Jordan's party, the quartet from East Egg, were rent asunder by dissension. An East Egg group also kept themselves kind of aloof, aloof, aloof from everyone else. And they are acting like they don't really want to be there. They may not have anything better to do, but they certainly think they're above everybody else who is obviously from West Egg. And they're, they're an East Egg group there. But even they, after drinking enough, start to kind of lose their manners and uh, they become like everybody else. So one of the men was talking with curious intensity to a young actress and his wife, after attempting to laugh at the situation in a dignified and indifferent way, broke down entirely and resorted flank attacks. In intervals, she appeared suddenly at his side as an angry uh, diamond and hissed, you promised. I love that name. I mean, just using that word hissed. Sometimes you have to stop and think about, especially with poetry, what does this sound like? And when I just lowered my voice there and said, you promised, there's this hissing sound, right? And now I'm probably going to keep noticing it. So uh, just as easy as it, as it, it all gets excite, excited and everybody's, you know, having a good time and they're overly excited over nothing, then the chatter starts, then all the stuff starts. All, the same intensity is what also kind of breaks it down. Um, so I want to go back to Nick for a minute. Remember in the beginning of the novel how he said that he's reserved to um, make judgments. His father gave him that advice and and he knows that he's had more advantages. And of course he said after that it had a limit. But there's some things that's very telling about Nick and his tolerance of people. Uh, for instance, in the last chapter, the guy had a little bit of shaving cream on his face. When he finally passed out, Nick said, you know, I, I finally got a towel and wiped the shaving cream that had been troubling me all evening. He sounds a little OCD, right? Um, and so with women, he is, so what we know from so far is that he's very non-committal. And I think it's because he has such a high expectation of what, wh whoever this woman is, what she should be. Now he knows what he's getting with Jordan. He knows that she's not honest. But notice that he says that it's not something you expect a woman to have, is to possess honesty. And so if he's really being honest with himself, and he's talking about this woman that um, he had this tangled back home. I'd been writing letters once a week and signing them with love, Nick. He's basically writing her once a week. And then he says, and all I could think of was how when that certain girl played tennis, a faint mustache of perspiration appeared on her upper lip. That's what he can think about, is this little reality that appears and that, that turns him off. So if something like that can be bothersome to this guy, then it, you're probably going to be destined to be alone anyways, you know, because there's always going to be something. And that's why I said at the very beginning, 
one of the quotes that you should remember for this book is when Nick says that he wanted everything to be uniform and at moral attention forever. Okay, so next video, I'm going to try to do four and five together because I think that's just a lot more plot than anything else. And then six is, is really good. So um, as far as having like writing as a whole. Okay, so see you next time.